<clears throat> so <clears throat> today on on on, uh, on March thirty uh, first, Zaha Hadid died <clears throat> in a hospital in uh, in Miami <clears throat> in the United States. Sorry about my voice. As you can see, I am uh, I am rather uh, um, crippled, so to speak. <clears throat> so Dame <clears throat> Dame Zaha Mohammed Muhammad Hadid. <clears throat> was born on the 31st of October 1950, uh, died on the 31st of March 2016, <clears throat> was a British Iraqi architect, artist and designer, rec recognized as a major figure in architecture of the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Born in Baghdad, Iraq, Hadid studied mathematics as an undergraduate and then enrolled at the Architectural Association School of Architecture in 1972. In search for of an alternative system to traditional architectural drawing and influenced by suprematism and the Russian avant-garde, particularly Malevich, if I may add, Hadid adopted painting as a design tool and abstraction as an investig investigative principle to reinvestigate the aborted and untested experiments of modernism to unveil new fields of building. Those are were her words. <clears throat> she was described by the Guardian as the queen of the curve, who liberated architectural geometry, giving it a whole new expressive identity. Her major works include the London Aquatic Center for the 2012 Olympics, the Broad Art Museum, Rome's Maxi Museum, and the Guangzhou, Guangzhou Opera House. Some of her awards have been presented posthumously, including the statuette for the 2017 Brit Awards. Several of her buildings were still under construction at the time of her death, including the Daxing, Daxing, Daxing International Airport in Beijing and the al Wakrar Stadium in Qatar, a venue for the 2022 FIFA World Cup. Hadid was the first woman to receive the Pritzker Architecture Prize in 2004. She received the UK's most prestigious architectural award, the Sterling Prize, in 2010 and 2011. In 2012, she was made a dame by Elizabeth II for services to architecture, and in February 2016, the month preceding her death, she became the first woman to be individually, individually awarded the Royal Gold Medal for, from the Royal Institute of British Architects. Ray Eames and Sheila O'Donnell had been previously awarded jointly with anyway. Okay, <clears throat> we'll begin uh, the journey in her work with a, with, a, with a project that made her famous. She won the competition for the Peak Leisure Club in 1982, so she was 32 years old already. Uh, she worked on competitions, she didn't win. She did uh, a lot of uh, experimental designs. <clears throat> it took her more than 10 years to actually be able to, <clears throat> to build something. And you know, this is the road of adventure. This is the road of passion. Your heart is somewhere, you fight for something, you might lose, you might lose at the beginning, you might lose even at the end. But the important thing is to, to follow your path, to follow your passion, to follow your heart. And this is what she did with all the sacrifices. The, I'll show you now the drawings for the peak in Hong Kong. Uh, <clears throat> she won the, the first prize, but it was not built. Uh, but already her works uh, showed the <clears throat> the vitality, the dynamism, the, the unconventionality, even of her mode of repre representation. She didn't use the typical, uh, you know, quiet, placid, uh, linear perspective. Her volumes exploded. And I suggest as students, follow your passion, follow your intuitions. Don't give in for, for uh, timidity or, uh, you know, all kinds of restrictive uh, recommendations for a so-called architectura cum patata. Okay. Uh, yes, yes, her works are not, uh, you know, beyond, uh, beyond uh, some questions. 
I found uh, looking um, carefully at some of, some of her works, I found certain aspects that, uh, you know, someone might think uh, it could have, could have been done better or, or differently. But all in all, one cannot deny the, 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 the incredible uh, inventive, in, inventiveness of uh, Dame uh, Zaha Hadid. <clears throat> you, you look at this, look at this drawing. You know, the, the, the timid one would say, this is not architecture. Well, this was done by a Pritzker Prize winner, okay? And was done by someone, I think she's the only one who received the Sterling Prize, the most important prize in, in UK, in, the, in, in Great Britain, uh, in architecture. Not to mention many, many, many other things. And her office still has more, for, more than 400 employees. So that, you know, uh, the truth of the matter is the beauty of architecture cannot be uh, restrained and sabotaged by those who are not creative. It, it, it can't and it shouldn't. So those who love architecture, please follow Zaha. Not necessarily in terms of, um, you know, following uh, her aesthetics, follow her path, her existential path. This is what this is. This is the most important thing, I think. The the the, the model she showed in terms of living one's life totally dedicated to a cause, and uh, and uh, she served that cause, cause brilliantly, and unconventionally. After she won this competition, AA in London organized a big exhibition with the works for this competition and other works, and little by little recognition. Uh, recognition came in. You might say, well, what does Zaha Hadid, born in Baghdad, have to do, and studying mathematics previously, have to do with um, Kazimir Malevich, the Russian constructivist who inspired her so much? Well, she, she wanted a revolution. She wanted to change the world. She felt that she was made to contribute to that change, and indeed she was. So, you know, Again, if you feel in your heart a calling, listen to that calling. It's authentic. It's in your heart. Listen to it and don't care about, uh, you know, uh, the timid ones will tell you. But be courageous. Be courageous and, 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 uh, and, uh, and uh, radical. She was very radical. I mean, look at, look, at, look at these architectural plans. And again, she won the first prize. So as it has been said, if you risk, you might lose. But if you don't re risk, you lose for sure. She won. In this case, she won. And then afterwards, a lot. <clears throat> what do we see here? We see purity. We see uh, art. We see abstraction. We see a dreamer. We see someone who is not concerned with the petty aspects of architecture, but with, uh, with its uh, soul, with its essence. I mean, even his, her way of, 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 uh, of um, representing her project, uh, look at this, you know, it, it's not the, the typical one, you know, with a T-square and a rectangle, you know, st straight uh, horizontal lines, and then it's not. It's not because she understood that the world was on, 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 on the verge of, of, of a radical change. <clears throat> and the radical change came together with a digital world. And, uh, you know, in a way, the whole world is in turmoil. You know, the, the internet, the, the networking, the incredible age of communication where you can communicate instantly. So the, 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 the static understanding of spy, space and time do not work any longer. They are contradicted by the very realities of our time. So there is a need for a different kind of conception about space and about time. We cannot work any longer with the old paradigms. But uh, I don't know how long uh, the schools of architecture need to understand this. Uh, <clears throat> 
But as I said, I had seen uh, two works by her in, in Vienna, uh, one better than the other one, but the housing uh, project that she did was not as impressive as I would have liked it to be. She claimed, she said, her desideratum was to build a row, R-A-W, a row, uh, earthy, meaning belonging to the earth with earthy qualities, and vital architecture. I think she did build a vital architecture, but I'm not so sure about rawness and uh, earthiness. Uh, I th maybe if she would have lived longer, maybe she would have moved in that direction. And actually, Patrick Schumacher, who is uh, leading her office now, they seem to make steps in that um, direction through tectonism, and I will arrive at it later. Because her architecture is actually smooth and slick, it's not raw and it's not earthy. But the premise for what she wanted to build are there, is there. And maybe she needed a little more time to be able to <clears throat> arrive at. Unfortunately, uh, ah, and I forgot, you know, I told you I, I am not, I had not been well for two weeks, but. Uh, I wanted to include in the presentation, and I have a link, I, I could have done it, and I, I regret I didn't, a project that uh, a friend of ours on Zoom, um, Vatsal from India, uh, brought to my attention, a, a project that she did with underground skyscrapers. In fact, skyscrapers in reverse, skyscrapers which do not point towards the sky, but towards the, to the, towards the center of the earth, meaning downwards. And this is very interesting. First of all, let's not talk about functionality, but what do they represent? You know, in a way, earth scrapers, not skyscrapers. He reversed, she re reversed them. She, pulled, she simply turned them upside down. And uh, I think maybe deep down she was pessimistic. Maybe deep down, she didn't quite believe in this uh, proliferation of verticalities, although she built skyscraper herself and quite convincingly. But she does have a project, and uh, again, I regret I don't have it here, but I can, I can send you the link uh, where you can see some drawings that she did with, with uh, earth scrapers, meaning, you know, underground sky, um, so called skyscrapers. But even this drawing that she did for uh, this rendering that she did for uh, uh, for Hong Kong is, um, you know, in my opinion, dark somehow in its meanings. Because because uh, the background is dark, uh, is blackness, and then the buildings seem to, uh, you know, explode. So this is not. What I see here is not truly a paradisiacal image. Anyway, she also did this. She did many um, renderings or representations of her project for the peak. She had a vision and she tried to visualize that vision. It was a reformed earth. You, you don't see trees in her in her renderings you see rather abstracted landscapes like here in fact you might say this is not on the earth it's on the moon uh, or, or mars and, and and yes her architecture gives the impression sometimes that does not belong to the earth not in a conventional way she was an artist she was a mathematician she became an architect she I think she did brilliantly, you know, she was able to build, not just to dream in the attic of an old building. No, she, she was able to, to, to dream and, and act, to use the words of Ginny Gang, actionable idealism. Now, I don't know if she presented all these um, renderings uh, in, 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 in her competition, because, you know, competitions usually require uh, a strict format and a strict number of pages and so on. Maybe she continued to work on it or, but one thing is for sure, she went beyond the expectations of the competition. And, uh, you know, she was, she was defending her vision. 
Now the Cardiff Bay Opera House, which she also won and unfortunately was not built. But you know, this, this lack of successes actually, these failures in a way, uh, paved, paved the way for her for, for a lot of uh, you know, publicity because she won the previous competition. She won this one as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, little by little, the world became uh, accustomed to, uh, to be challenged by Zaha Hadid. And here I am saying again what Wolf Prix, her friend, uh, said. Reality doesn't make us. We make reality. Zaha Hadid made reality. This is very important to say. You know, she didn't just, uh, you know, lament that she cannot change reality, that, that, that reality is stronger than her. No. People with vision can implement a new way of living and a new way of doing architecture and a new way of painting and sculpting and so on. This is exactly what Brinko said, through, uh, did through his sculpture, you know? And not just his sculpture, but his way of living as well. So again, I think if there is a potential, and I think there is in many of you, in many of us, we should follow our calling. And we should not let that calling die because it would be a terrible, terrible loss. So she did this uh, Cardiff uh, <clears throat> Opera House. She won the competition. It was not built. In a way, a victory is built on a sum of failures. Uh, Jean Nouvel said that he is probably the architect who lost the largest number of uh, uh, competitions ever. I don't know. <laughs> I think I could compete for that prize myself. Uh, well, I didn't participate in so many, but I know what it means to fail in, a, in, other, in other words, not to win. But it, you know, what is important is the fight with yourself. You really fight with your limits. You know, you try your best, you make the work, you send it, and if it's not appreciated, it's beyond you. But you grow, in the process you grow. This is what I keep saying to the students. Follow your calling, express your passion. Don't care about, uh, you know, fears. Try to conquer them. I know they exist. They exist in me too. But we should attempt to, to conquer them. The more authenticity we have in the world, the better. The more people we have who express their inner world and, and, uh, and their vision, the better. So we should do it. I mean, you know, someone told me I didn't expect her to, to, to build anything. Well, she did. And not only that she did, that she did brilliantly and, and much, 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 much better than those who followed um, the, you know, the common, uh, the common road, the common path. There were other architects, of course, architects of vision like Antonio Santelia. Well, Santelia died at 28. Uh, 28, uh, who knew about Zaha Hadid? She won a 32, the peak competition. So one has to be also a little bit patient, but never give up on your inner world because the truth is there in your inner world. And explore as much as you can. <clears throat> you know, turn the building upside down, build it, build it from the top downwards and then build it from the uh, bottom upwards or from the side, or start with a, with a section. Massimiliano Fuchsas, for example, said, I never start a building, designing a building with a plan, maybe with a section. So there, <clears throat> there are other possibilities. Try to escape the, the you know, the, the fatigue actually of, of uh, you know, commonness and, uh, you know, uh, whatever, you know, the timid ones tell you. You can start a building uh, by drawing with a stick in the sand. You don't even have to make the plan. Uh, you know, after all, what drawings did they have when they built the cathedrals in uh, medieval France? Maybe they had something, but uh, they certainly didn't have working drawings done placidly at a drafting board. Uh, even Gaudi, what kind of working drawings? Uh, more than that, could you have done working drawings in, in, in 
you know, conventional sense of the word for Sagrada Familia? No. No. Anyway, so this is the opera in Cardiff, which she won, and she couldn't uh, build it. It was not built. Uh, but, but, but she developed and uh, she grew and, uh, you know, uh, her archive, I'm sure, is giant. Now you'll see uh, a, a group of projects, incomplete, completed, and a few unbuilt uh, projects. Uh, this is in Melbourne, in Australia, a tower. Uh, she made many proposals for towers. <clears throat> Some were built. And, uh, you know, again, they stand out. Uh, you might like them, you might not like them, but they stand out. How is this building called? I think it's just the, I don't know, the, the street is mentioned. I don't know if it has a name. 600 Collins Street in Melbourne. She has many studies. You can find on the web uh, images with, uh, you know, many prototypes and many variations and uh, sometimes small, sometimes bigger. She was searching for something. It's not that the first sketch became a, a tower. What is also interesting, but maybe I'll mention this uh, later, that she seemed to have towards the, the end of her life, uh, her architecture uh, sometimes uh, seemed to lean towards almost some kind of a classicization. It's, it's kind of strange in a way, because on one hand, she advocated um, total freedom, total fluidity or fluid totality to use the, the names of two books that were published with the works of her students in Vienna. But on the other hand, there is also a flower which seems to insinuate itself in the plants and even in the image of some of her works, later works, even here somehow, even uh, some kind of a um, yet symmetry, but uh, it's interesting in a way, and, and she could have evolved maybe to, towards what I might call uh, the classicization of uh, fluidity. Uh, I know it sounds oxymorotic and strange. Mercury House Tower in Malta, uh, these were not uh, built uh, yet at least, uh, and uh, there are interesting here too certain things, you know, uh, these distortions halfway, you know, kind of uh, in the middle of the tower. It's, it's this tension between uh, the predictability of this part and the part underneath and then the twisting, the distortions in the middle. I will show also works of her office now. And, uh, you know, something of, 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 of Zaha Hadid continues. But uh, she was lucky to meet um, uh, Patrick Schumacher, whom initially understood she didn't want to hire. But uh, uh, so it shows that sometimes the, the first impression is not the correct one. Uh, in the end, she, he became indispensable to her. So much so that once when he was in China uh, uh, to assist with the construction of an important project there, she called the client and told her uh, that uh, Patrick had to come immediately back to London. And the client protested, said, well, we can't, we can't build a building without Patrick here. And she said, I don't care. Patrick comes immediately back to London. So there. The, the, the man who at first she, she wouldn't hire became indispensable to her. And, and there are pictures with both of them. And I saw on YouTube, uh, you know, interviews or discussions where both were present. And I felt that, that Zaha became extremely 
not dependent, but maybe even dependent. I, I, I think she, 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 she grew uh, into, into um, uh, finding in Patrick Schumacher truly a, a remarkable partner. And I think he was, and I, I think he continues to be. This is a, a, a center for art in Cagliari in Italy on hold. <clears throat> I mean, again, if she built just this building and nothing else, and it would have it would have been a remarkable, uh, uh, you know, life. So, again, those, the detractors don't know what they are talking about. You know, it's. I mean, she has. I didn't count them, and it's probably difficult to count, but countless, countless uh, uh, projects and buildings, and uh, some of them very, very interesting, if not all of them. Even this one, if it would be built, it would certainly not be uh, the, 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 the least interesting building in the world, far from it. If something bothers me, uh, if I'm allowed to say something like this, is the excessive whiteness and uh, this slickness, you know, this uh, smoothness, you know, which is actually in contradiction with what she declared that she wanted a raw architecture, an earthy architecture. Well, this is neither raw nor earthy, but vitality does have. If she would have brought in, you know, maybe different materials, you know, even organic materials, stones, uh, you know, uh, truly raw materials, but this is not a raw architecture. Uh, but uh, vitality does have, and, and in, in terms of form, uh, it is um, it is remarkable. I, I I hope it will be built. Even white, as it is shown here. I have been in a building like this in Vienna, and there also I, I felt that the excessive whiteness was a little bit problematic and the excessive smoothness. Otherwise, everything was fine. The spatial experience, you know, the drama of the building. But this sleek whiteness is, um, is not raw. So this was not built yet, but it might, it might get built. I don't know. Um, the Freedom Square in Nicosia in Cyprus, uh, another project that um, was not yet built. So I show now projects that were not built and also projects that were uh, finalized or in the, in, the, in the course of construction during after her death. And then in the other three presentations, you'll see other things. I try to cover as much ground uh, regarding her work, but still I cannot say that I, 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 I covered everything. The Esfera City Center in Monterey, Mexico. Um, well, here I have some uh, certain reticence in the sense that yes, it looks good. But there is a, a certain hedonism at play here that uh, a little bit bothers me because Mexico has many problems and uh, not everybody is rich. But here we see a joie de vivre that seems to ignore uh, the realities uh, or other, the other realities which are not small at all of, of Mexico. So you know, flamboyance and, uh, you know, exuberance, aesthetical and otherwise might, might, might uh, be a little bit uh, questioned from a position of, uh, you know, social concerns and so on. And I know there was always injustice and inequality in the world, I know, but, um, you know, to, to advocate a, a splendor, which, uh, I mean, look at these cars here, and look at the white highway. And of course, this project was not done at a time when we, 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 we began to experience the climate change and the, 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 the stringent need for sustainability and to fight pollution. So th 
this project was generated during a time when uh, you know progress seemed to be uh, unstoppable and you know optimism as well but uh, things changed now we are condemned to be locked in our rooms the pandemic is not yet gone far from it and so such visions maybe can be uh, seen uh, uh, with uh, darker uh, glasses a little bit I would say, and uh, yes, I am subjective, and uh, I apologize if I if I uh, formulate uh, maybe questionable thoughts. But in my opinion, um, Zaha uh, missed uh, something from the other side of society. Her her friends, her her uh, acquaintances, they all belong to a certain elite, often uh, um, associated with high fashion you know, uh, great designers. Uh, and uh, I, I have a feeling that this actually amplified her solitude. I think she didn't have the, the, the wisdom that, for example, Le Corbusier had, who refused to go to um, mundane parties and found uh, more meaning and pleasure even in talking with fishermen at the edge, at the edge of, the, of the sea. Zaha, uh, as far as I know, you know, she, she, she didn't build social housing. She was not concerned with, uh, with those who, who were underprivileged. I would even say that as far as I know, she didn't express, and I, I formulated this before, I don't, know, I don't know how she abstained from protesting the war in Iraq when the bombers coming from the United States mainly, but also from Great Britain, were bombing her own country, her own people. And she had a voice. She could have been heard, and she didn't say anything. To me, this is a mystery. Uh, I know for lucrative reasons, uh, would not have been wise. But in terms of integrity and ethics and the love for one's country, you know, uh, I think she should have said something. And, as far as I know, I don't, I don't know if she said, I don't think she did. She never protested that war. That war in which one million Iraqis died and uh, almost 40,000 American soldiers and many others. She could have protested and I, I, I'm sorry if she didn't and I think she didn't. Uh, so, <laughs> You know, with all due respect and all admiration and all uh, the examples she gave, I think there are also shadowy parts. The New Century City Art Center in Chengdu, uh, China. Uh, again, how could you do such a project, white and splendid, while almost simultaneously bombers were attacking your own hometown and your country? How could that building still be white and splendid? This is my question. You know, it's, it's something I do not comprehend. I, I mean, can we divorce ethics from aesthetics? I don't think we should. I mean, look at this sky. It is as if nothing happened, but something that did happen. Imagine you were in Baghdad at that time and imagine that while you were eating with your family, a bomb was dropped right on your living room or dining room on your house. And it happened many times. And we keep designing, you know, happy-go-lucky as if nothing happened. Yes, the sky here is dark. Yes, it should have been dark. Uh, dark uh, because that war was very, very dark and very unjust for oil. That's why one million people died for oil. And yet the walls are still white and smooth and sleek as if nothing happened. Imagine throwing a can of red paint on that white wall because then it would be more truth on that white wall. I'm not trying to diminish her greatness. Her greatness was real. 
but I, I would try, I, I try to, to, to tell the truth as I see it. I think certain things had to be, say, had to be said, and I am surprised nobody asked her, how come you didn't protest that war? The Dominion Tower in Moscow, in Russia, uh, this was built, and uh, I hope I have it here uh, built, these are the plans. As in other buildings by her, this is a little bit different from other buildings. There isn't so, so much fluidity around the building, but the core, the, the atrium is, uh, has a certain drama, which can be seen in other buildings by her, for example, the Cincinnati Art Museum, which I saw. Otherwise, the white building, as you see it, uh, is uh, rather predictable towards the outside. Maybe she couldn't uh, do something more uh, radical, I don't know. It's not a bad building, although there is a little bit of manners here, this um, you know, transition from taller windows to less tall windows through this uh, middle, this uh, intermediate window with the, the bottom in this way. This is a little bit graphic and a little bit facile, and, facile, and I, I, I used to do it too, and I'm not proud of it. But the interior is, is, uh, is uh, I think, very good. And uh, at least here, besides whiteness, there is also blackness. There is also blackness. And the vis viscerality of, of, of the interior is, uh, is authentic. A little bit graphic, but uh, it is still uh, valid in, in, in its abstraction. So this was built in Russia. <clears throat> By the way of whiteness and blackness, I will show you her grave, where I discovered today something uh, <clears throat> very strange, in my opinion. We'll, we'll see it very soon. <clears throat> The Dan, Danjiang Bridge in New Taipei in Taiwan, a very nice bridge. Uh, I don't know if it was built, but um, I think it is. Uh, it shows clearly her, her talent uh, and uh, her ability to, to work on, on, on such diverse programs. It can be a stadium, it can be a bridge, it can be an office tower, it can be anything except perhaps a single family home. In that field, she built just one house. She started another one in Switzerland. We'll see the one in Russia, the one that she built. But I think her, her understanding of uh, what a house or a home is, um, is, is, uh, is to be discussed. If I have any reservation about her works, is in the field of domesticity. And I am, I am, I am not at all uh, promoting domesticity because I'm terrible at that level. But I think, I think she couldn't do a home. What she built for that extravagant uh, billionaire in Russia is not really a home in the, you know, the, the accepted sense of the word. Also, when I think somebody told me who went to her house, a Turkish uh, architect, uh, a woman, uh, and she was invited once at Zaha, and she told me that uh, she didn't have a kitchen in her house. Zaha had, didn't have a kitchen. And not because she couldn't build one or she couldn't afford one. Of course she did. It was by choice. And it was maybe a manifesto. And I understand from the side of feminism, you know, why should a woman be always associated with a kitchen, right? She shouldn't. But from here to not have a kitchen at all is a little bit uh, extreme because, <clears throat> you know, for Frank Lloyd Wright, the, the, the hearth was always at the center of the home. Not to have a hearth uh, it's, it's almost not to have a center. 
Anyway, we are looking at the bridge now, and you look at the, the impeccable uh, renditions. You know, the, the renderings are incredible. You know, it, it even shows, you know, the, the armature and, the, you know, at, at this level, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to compete with an office like Zaha Hadid in a competition. It's, you know, what can you do? You know, I mean, these people make renderings that you could swear the building was built, and these are just photographs of the building. In fact, I was I was joking a little bit, but I'm thinking if we can make renderings so realistic and so convincingly so, why should we build it? You know, just just be content with uh, incredibly uh, well done renderings and imagine that. Uh, the building was built and we won't consume of course i'm a little bit cynic now but uh, we won't consume resources will certainly be very sustainable because as somebody said <clears throat> the best way to be sustainable is to not build at all now from here to what louis uh, uh, leon Crier said at the end of the, the 20th century i am an architect therefore i do not build maybe it's not such a long distance the Iraqi parliament building in Baghdad, which was also not built. And uh, we see the relationship between it and that tower in, uh, in uh, Melbourne, Australia. But this was not built. So she has been selected to design the new Iraqi parliament building in Baghdad. The controversial decision comes after London-based assemblage was crowned as winner of a RIBA-led competition for the building, which placed Hadith's proposal third placed, though a dispute began once the competition's clients sparked conversations with Hadid after the winning firm was named, the client stated that uh, the competition rules allow for any shortlisted design proposal to be ultimately chosen for construction. So apparently in the end, her project, although was placed third, uh, gained ground. Former RIBA president and competition jury member Sunan Prasad backed the client's claim, stating, obviously we selected a winner, therefore we would like to have seen it built, but the client reserved the right to pick any of the top three, and they have gone ahead and done that. But as far as I know, it was not built yet. The Qatar Stadium, which is uh, probably almost done, um, where it seems many people died uh, who, who, who were building it. Uh, we, we, we shouldn't blame Zaha for, for their death, of course, although some people did that. Now, I don't think she was responsible for, um, you know, taking care of, of, of the construction workers. She did a project and, uh, you know, uh, what can we say? It's very sad what happened. But her, her stadium is brilliant, and she did a brilliant uh, uh, proposal for Tokyo. She won that competition for Tokyo for the, um, for the, the, the Olympics of 2020, now maybe 2021, because of the pandemic. But Japan sabotaged her, and they gave the project to Kengo Kuma, who, who built a mediocre stadium. Mediocre and apparently, in part at least, also inspired by the project by Zaha. Zaha sued him in court. I don't know what happened with that um, uh, court procedure, but uh, one thing is for sure. Japan belittled itself. They built a mediocre stadium. Uh, uh, and if I compare it with the stadiums that Kenzo Tange built, uh, you know, 50 years earlier, 60 years earlier, uh, we see the difference between Japan then and Japan now. Truly, Ken Gokuma could have done better and should have done better. He really built a very mediocre stadium, while the brilliant project by Zaha was not built. Now, recently completed is this one in Qatar. Uh, and uh, yes, those with uh, an inclination for... Uh, <clears throat> biological speculations could uh, be tempted to see certain things in this uh, stadium. This is not the point. The point is, it is an interesting stadium and uh, it functions. And, uh, you know, how many women design stadiums? You know, 
and she's, it, it is not the only thing that she did. I have a question for you. Please. Uh, what, is, what is this uh, scripture material on the roof? The finishing uh, material. Pardon? The finishing material. The finishing material? On the roof, yeah. Yes. On the roof? Yeah. You mean here? Yeah, over there. I don't know. I mean, uh, <laughs> it's, it's an open, uh, it's an op it opens, so it's possible that that uh, here, I mean, I no, don't. No, 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 no. I don't mean that. I mean, uh, the material uh, from the bullseye view. Uh, on the uh, ultimate uh, image, you can see it. I, I don't understand. The picture before. This oh, one? Before again. Before again. That here. I mean here, this material, the, the white, well, this white material. Are you mean here? Yeah, I'm very curious here. I will be honest, I, I don't know. I didn't read the, the technicalities of the project, but uh, you know, it could be anything. It could be plastic material, metal, it could be ceramic material. I don't know. We can, we can seek, we, surely we can find out on the website of, um, of Zaha Hadid Architects. Okay. I will. I will. I will uh, look uh, myself, and I will uh, let you know uh, the next time we meet. Yeah, I think uh, so. Well, uh, the interesting, uh, the the inter interesting thing is about the structural engineers behind this architect Zahadi. So, so I'm very curious how did they uh, make this kind of splendid structural? I'm so curious. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, in, in this field, I think the, there are no limits, you know, there are, you know, anything is possible. There are countless materials one can use and, uh, you know, all they had all the money in the world there. So, you know, I'm sure they had all kinds of proposals to, you know, any company would have even invented a material to uh, just to have the chance to, to participate to the making of this building. Mm -hmm. I'm agreed. Okay, thank you. Uh, with pleasure. Um, okay, so we go on. So this was built and hopefully in 2022 the pandemic will be gone. In this case though, you see at the bottom here something uh, rather unusual and uh, maybe she couldn't uh, get away from it. I mean, here we have uh, an ornamental design that is rather um, traditional as opposed to what is above, but it's not uh, really bothering the difference between one and the other. Maybe Qatar wanted, you know, something, uh, you know, more, uh, uh, you know, visibly connecting with a certain tradition that perhaps they have. <clears throat> this is uh, uh, the winter 2016, so she died in 2016, the Mathematics Gallery at the Science Museum in London. Um, it's an interior design project. It doesn't really look like uh, anything having to do with mathematics, right? Because it's rather ludic, but uh, it is. I see there life and death, interesting. What does this have to do with mathematics? And then on the right, trade and travel. Hmm. I don't know exactly what it is, but it was built. Uh, with, with an office like hers, where even now they have a, a research department within the office, which is quite ample, uh, you know, a good number of people just do research. So the, 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 the potency, uh, you know, in terms of creativity of this office is unbelievable. You know, they can, you know, they, they, they can come up with uh, incredible solutions to any problem and you know they can afford to have 20 30 people out of 400 and something to just do research and uh, you know uh, yes it's a very very powerful office and it was generated by the by the you know by a single single lady initially you know she she made it possible
I mean, it's so difficult to pay a salary to five people or three people or even one, one person. But to pay more than 400 salaries in London, you can imagine what, what a giant you know, enterprise this was. Now, Zaha Hadid architects carves out sculptural flood protection barrier in Hamburg. This was done after her death. So Zaha Hadid architects has completed the sculptural Niederhafen river promenade in Hamburg, Germany, as part of the city's upgrade of its flood prevention system, positioned along the 625 meter long stretch between St. Paul and whatever, uh, it replaces one of the city's existing but dilapidating flood barriers built in 1964. Uh, okay, so, you know, they did this work here, which is a barrier against flooding, but also functions as an amphitheater, a promenade, and so on. So she did, they did also, and again, they do anything. They do object design, they, they do furniture design, they do even uh, fashion design, or they did. I understood that in her office when she was alive, there was a department that was designing, uh, you know, shoes and bags on short order. She would come in and, and tell them, you know, I am invited to a party on Friday. Please be kind and produce these shoes and this bag. And they did. And, you know, why not? You know, yes, there is extravagance, but... Uh, it, it was really, uh, again, about creativity, you know. Why not also design a pair of shoes and a nice bag if you can afford it? So this is in Hamburg, in Germany, and we see the bird's eye view. It's nice. It's nice and, uh, you know, it's an urban intervention that is uh, graphically pleasing and, uh, you know, socially engaging. Now, this building on Fifth Avenue in New York was not built yet, and maybe it will not be built. Here we see what I call the classicization of fluidity, where geometry seems to follow a different path. Uh, an interesting uh, change, I think, in her work and in the work of her office. California residence, and, uh, this was a building that was not built. I rush a little bit because I have three more presentations uh, and we have a lot, a lot to see. Now, the Middle East Center, St. Anthony's College in Oxford. Uh, so she built also, uh, you know, a shining, metallic, uh, reflecting uh, building uh, at Oxford. Why not? A prestigious uh, campus and university certainly afforded uh, modernistic intervention. How can you push education forward if you do not act accordingly. So I think, you know, if you have an old building as you see here, and you have an old building as you have here, why not have a building by Zaha Hadid in between? Harmony through contrast. Too bad that too much whiteness on the walls, but anyway, the Dubai Opera House in Dubai, the, 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 the young and restless Dubai, uh, where, you know, um, uh, based on, uh, on gas, on oil, uh, you know, they, they became almost the, the architecture capital of the world. And here is a view from the top, was not built yet. But here is the model. And uh, somebody said, the straight line is the line of duty and the curved line is the line of beauty. I don't know, but I think there is a, some truth in this. Yes, the straight line is the line of duty and the curved line is the line of beauty. Although maybe sometimes the curved line is not the line of beauty and maybe other times the straight line is the line of beauty. It all depends. But in general, there is some truth, I think. Uh, 
Reggio, Italy. <clears throat> she, it, it's unbelievable how many projects they did, you know. But when you have 400 people or so, uh, you know, uh, you can do it. The amazing thing is the, 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 the tenacity with which the office was able to produce. Lately, I saw a few projects that seem to deviate a little bit from the trademark, from the, you know, the, the brand Zaha Hadid, this kind of fluidity. So I guess they are, they, they, they are ex experimenting with other things as well, without giving up on this. Now, as long as you have a building by Zaha and a vast amount of water, a lake, a sea, an ocean, and then a beautiful blue sky, certainly without pollution, the world is fine. Now here, I don't know, this is not whiteness, this is blackness. So this was pre proposed for Italy, now back to Dubai. Uh, it's this building here, but maybe she did this one as well. It looks like a Zaha Hadid uh, uh, tower or towers. Yes. She built in China. We are going to see a few build uh, towers by her, which are, uh, you know, uh, appreciable. She still has adversaries, even, uh, you know, uh, formidable adversaries. I would say that Kenneth Frampton is one of them, uh, particularly about his, her later works. But you see the flower, the flower that I mentioned, you know, so the fluidity seems to, uh, you know, serve somehow um, longed for flower. And uh, this is interesting, I think, because you remember the project for the peak that I showed at the beginning, and now you see a flower. Who'd have thought? Because a flower here has a center. It's like regrouping the energies, bringing them back to some kind of a, a centrality that flourishes the kind uh, a flower symbolizes and expresses. Now, the Tokyo National Stadium, which I, I, I mentioned that she won the competition but was not built, much, 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 much better than, than Ken Gokuma. In, in Ken Gokuma's place, I, I would be ashamed. I don't know if he copied something from Zaha. That's what uh, the office of Zaha Hadid uh, uh, stated publicly, very vehemently, but Regardless, <laughs> what he built is incredibly <laughs> mediocre and banal. And, and you know, uh, Ken Gokuma is not uh, any architect. I'm very surprised. Anyway, so this remains a project. Another failure of humanity to invest properly in what would have deserved to be, um, to be built. Anyway, uh, yeah, certainly such an image was not generated at the time of the pandemic. Now we look at the, the single uh, private residence that she built in Russia uh, for a very rich gentleman. And uh, this is the building. And the building is, in my opinion, uh, not the most intimate building in the world. I don't know if a dog would, uh, would love to sleep uh, in the proximity of this building or inside this building. It, it is said that a dog, where a dog uh, sleeps, uh, you know, kind of at peace with itself is, uh, is where a home is. ACS is an interesting building. One would say a building for James Bond 
but is it truly a home? I don't know, because the building seems to want to take off, you know, go somewhere else. And then also being built above the level of the trees, you know, is not living under the, the trees, is living above the trees. And I don't know. I have a feeling here that it's, it's, it's the same attitude that uh, uh, <clears throat> governed the chief designer of MVRDV to say, uh, you know, outsmarting nature. I am not very convinced about this building, but because, you know, this part could have belonged to an airport, right? A control tower. And, you know, I know here is a billionaire from Russia, but there is a level of rhetoric here that uh, to me doesn't seem very convincing. I mean, this optimistic, futuristic, uh, you know, uh, explosion of forms, you know, and you'll see a section through this building. Uh, look here, look, this is a car. Now look at this basement or this base. My God, I mean, this is a public building. This is not a home. This is a car, a little car. And, you know, what is all this, this part of the building, which is almost under the level of the earth? And it's huge. I don't think it's intimate at all. I don't know if the Russian or Zahar Hadid know the paintings of uh, Emil Bonar, a great intimist painter. You know, and this is not about nostalgia. What makes a, a house a home? It's about, you know, intimacy, warmth, uh, you know, and, 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 and this building is rather institutional. So I really think she had a problem with uh, understanding what a home is, or maybe she rebelled against the very idea of a home. Maybe she felt in exile and she thought that everybody should be in exile. It's possible. This is the man, the ambitious man who hired the Zaha to build this extravaganza for Bonanza for him. And, you know, probably the solitude of the man in this, uh, in this uh, house is, uh, uh, in direct proportion with the uh, with uh, with the dimensions of, of 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 the house, you know. Also, this separation from human nature. You know, uh, yes, you see the trees there, but you are at the level higher than uh, higher than the, the trees actually. And uh, I think it's a cold house. Let's put it this way: I, it's cold, not because he doesn't have air conditioning, because I'm sure she, he does, but it's a cold house. I mean, uh, we see the chimney, but that's a romantic feature. In other words, it's not meant to warm uh, the, the apartment, it's just to look at and have the illusion that it warms you when the warmth actually comes from the ceiling or the floor or from the walls. And, uh, you know, like here, it's, it's, this is a, a so-called romantic feature, uh, giving you the illusion that you are like in the past, you know, warming uh, with uh, some pieces of wood this giant building. No, no, the, the heat comes from somewhere else. This is just uh, so you feel good about yourself and less guilty. To be in a romantic mood, so to speak. It's a romantic feature, so to speak. Uh, devoid of uh, real function. But, but I arrived uh, uh, this, in my opinion, very strange picture with a grave of Zaha Hadid in a British uh, cemetery, a very large cemetery in, in Great Britain. What is very strange is that here is her father, here is Zaha, and in my opinion, this is the wife, meaning the mother of Zaha and the wife of her father. How come Zaha is near her, I almost felt saying her husband, this is her father. This is the daughter and this is the wife. I think she is because I looked at the names. This is certainly the one in the middle belongs to Zaha Hadid. The one here belongs to her father. And this has the name also Hadid, a different name. And I think this is the mother. Also what is strange is this is white on, on a black base. 
The other two, as if they belong together, are black on a white base. I'm not, I don't know about the Muslim religion, but it's hard for me to imagine that the daughter shares Domus Eterna with a, with a, with a father, while the wife is at, at a distance from both. What do you think? Let's talk about this because I find it very strange. Anyone has any idea? Because if I didn't read the text, I would say here is uh, the father, here is the mother, and here is Zaha. No, here is Zaha near the father, and this is the mother. I think Sigmund Freud would have uh, would have been very interested in this picture. To put it brutally, I have a feeling that that and she did the design because this is this is certainly. Uh, you know, a modernistic design. This belongs to Zaha. She designed this. And to me, this is very strange. It is as if, sorry, Zaha, but as if you are married to your, your father. What do you think? I hear a noise. I want to hear some opinions about this. Then it must be a stepmother or maybe the father married a younger girl in later age. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I mean, I, I try to look, uh, it's, it's a possible interpretation, but even so, I don't think it's appropriate. The, the husband and the wife should belong together and the daughter should be, you know, a little bit aside. But, but it is a possible interpretation that Zaha took revenge on the younger wife and uh, she, you know, uh, uh, all in all, I find it strange. I tried to read here and it's, it's not very clear. Either she was born in 1907 or 1937, if she was born in 19, and she died in 2012. I imagine it's the mother. She cannot be a sister or anything. Dan, uh, did you see the negative positive that uh, the uh, the base is white here? Yeah, while, I did. Uh, I just yeah. mentioned. What do you make of this? Uh, while the her? base base in the mother is black. Yes. So maybe their natures were uh, Zaha was more a, a copy of her father. Maybe, and the mother was of a different nature. Well, yeah, but. <laughs> I don't know. I, I still find it very, very bizarre. Really, because if you don't read what's written on these stones, you would immediately would say, here are her parents and here is Zaha. You would not imagine that the daughter is near her father like this, and the mother, the wife, the wife of the father is, you know, look at uh, one meter away or one meter and a half away. And also, yes, chromatically, the difference. The father and the daughter, they are together, similar, but not this person. This one is, is, is banished, is estranged. And yet she is the wife of, of uh, I imagine she is the wife of, the, of, 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 of her father, meaning her, her mother. I don't know. But I find it strange. A strange and very provocative for uh, psychoanalytical interpretations. She probably had very high regard for her father. Yes, it's very possible. Please, please be kind and turn off the microphone. Okay, I, I continue the second presentation. Which is a little bit uh, adventurous, uh, you'll understand why. Zaha Hadid and sub-aquatic creatures. 
because I think there is a relationship between Zaha Hadid and subaquatic uh, creatures. Look at that, you know, they are in a way like Zaha's buildings or, the, or Zaha's buildings are kind of like this. There is a whole world outside of the, 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 the visible, meaning the immediate visible. And uh, I think, I think uh, a nature which is um, most of the time uh, not present in our horizon, so to speak, can be a source of uh, inspiration. Even here, some of his buildings uh, have uh, an allure of a, of a dangerous, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, fish. Um, yes, some aquatic creatures. Now, <clears throat> This uh, artist, Valerie Buss, uh, twists and turns paper into magical underwater creatures. Now, these are not so similar to Zaha Hadid's uh, buildings, but uh, I thought of uh, maybe as an intermezzo to, to include the, these things in the presentation. Now, drawings by Zaha Hadid, because she drew a lot, and the drawings are very important in her oeuvre. Uh, <clears throat> you know, th this was the way she made her projects, at least at the beginning. They were, in a way, abstract paintings. Now, of course, if you would make a project in a school like this, you would fail without any question. Well, it depends on the school, of course. She didn't fail at AA. She had a lot of uh, stamina, really. I understood that after she, after she finished her studies, she applied to, to work at uh, Rem Kolhas in his office. And uh, she was told, uh, you know, uh, she didn't have experience and, uh, you know, she might have been accepted, but uh, she said, I want to be accepted as a partner. Can you believe it? You just finished the school and you want to be already a partner in equal terms with a, with a boss or the bosses of the office. And uh, of course she had, uh, uh, you know, she had problems. Although she was friends with Rem Kolhas, but uh, incredible stamina. So, you know, we see in these graphic representations, one who has a very different conception about architecture and an architectural project. Although it is clear she knew how to build and uh, such a sketch became a building. Of course, with the help of uh, some very knowledgeable people of all kinds of software, but I keep telling the students, do such sketches. If you feel like it, if you don't feel like it, don't do it. But if you feel like doing it, start like this. Start like this and uh, it might be that you'll arrive at something very interesting then that you yourself didn't expect. Because painters often work in this way. They don't know where they will arrive. They just start painting and then the, ba the painting uh, grows and grows and they arrive at a place they didn't anticipate and not only that they didn't anticipate they didn't want to anticipate you know like Picasso said I, I, I don't uh, I don't search I find and in a way the painting finds itself and maybe even you know a project finds it finds you you see here that uh, you know from the abstraction of uh, sometimes anxious abstraction of the, the earlier works, she developed towards, you know, here we have almost a butterfly or parts of the wings of a butterfly or flowers. So uh, th there is a change. This is the project from the peak that you saw. And this is something uh, showing angst, but also showing some kind of a crystallization or in the intuition of some kind of a flower form. Mm-mm. 
and now we arrive at, uh, you know, uh, to me, the, these are equally beautiful, if not more beautiful than the previous, uh, than the previous drawings. Because this is really structural, the structural drawing, and I think it's beautiful. A life in projects. Now we see some other buildings, the Opus building in Dubai. The big erosions, what do they represent? Maybe on one hand they represent the future of the building or, or but it's not totally divorced from the first uh, uh, hypothesis is, uh, you know, an erosion which uh, derives from uh, a certain pessimism, an expression, an expression of pessimism, maybe. Sky Soho. Unveil senior skyscraper for Australia's Gold Coast. Again, if just one tower would have been proposed by another architect, that other architect might have claimed that he didn't, uh, you know, uh, live for nothing. And <laughs> she did so many, you know, some built, some, some not yet built, uh, but the archive and library building in Montpellier, this was built actually, but this is a rendering. A huge building, the stadium in Qatar, which we saw. Now this unveils a trio, trio of blossoming residential towers on the Brisbane riverfront. Hong Kong Polytechnic University joke, Jockey Club Innovation Tower. I like this building. Uh, it's it's leaning, yes, but uh, and perhaps this is one of the reasons I like it. It's very solid. It's massive, but it's leaning. It's leaning, and that leaning, I think, uh, I am tempted to think that expresses a certain uh, doubting or pessimism. She was a complex uh, person. She was in the jury at Pritzker when uh, Wang Shu uh, received the Pritzker Prize. And I was surprised because Wang Shu in a way is the opposite of what she was. And yet she was in the jury and she sustained, she, she supported the choice of Wang Shu, which means uh, she, she was able to look both ways because Wang Shu is in a way connected with what we call vernacular architecture Yes, very innovative, but uh, very concerned with uh, what we might call vernacular architecture. And Zaha was in the jury when he received the Pritzker Prize. And uh, I, I, I like this because she chose someone who works very differently from hers, from her. This is an interesting building. I like it. It's one of her best buildings, in my opinion. Now, it has been said that her buildings do not really connect with their environment, that, you know, they are individual monuments uh, all, all by themselves, you know, self-referential. Self, uh, this is probably true in, uh, in, in, in good measure, but uh, we need such, such buildings as well, perhaps, perhaps in, in, in the cities of the world. Also, I think the impact of Patrick Schumacher on, on the activity of the office was increasingly uh, significant. He, he, uh, Patrick Schumacher amplified the, the level of excellence uh, in, the, in the digital field. An art gallery in London, but this was not built, is this one here. City of Dreams Hotel <clears throat> Tower in Macau. This one we are going to see uh, in, in, in the third presentation in detail. This is just the project. And uh, again, to do something like this, you need a team of experts. You know, something like this, most people can't even draw, forget about building. 
they are very advanced. That's the truth. And Patrick Schumacher, even at AA, he, he developed, uh, the, there are research laboratories and they are very, very advanced. And this is a structure which became ornamental and the ornament became structural. It's a fine building and we are going to see it built. It's also an architecture which seems to flirt, so to speak, with the Middle Ages, with the Gothic cathedral. And uh, indeed, uh, Patrick Schumacher makes uh, references, uh, explicit references to, to, to the Gothic and the Gothic cathedrals. A contemporary art museum, which we saw already uh, some pictures in Italy, but it was not built. Apartment buildings in Milano, which actually she built for herself, in, if I understood correctly, she was the, the developer of these this, this buildings. What I like about this building is that they use also something else, not just whiteness, wood. And uh, this is uh, rare in her work, if not uh, unique. They are built. Uh, Daniel Lipskind also built uh, some, some blocks of flats himself near the ones built by uh, Zaha. So again, I read, if I remember correctly, she was the developer. She built this for, for herself. I think bringing in uh, other materials is a plus. If she would have done it more, uh, I think her buildings would have been even richer at the level of tectonics and, and tactility, materiality. There are certain manners, the, the, these, these, these uh, diagonals, these uh, transitions from uh, higher surfaces to less higher ones. Uh, she does this also with windows, but uh, I guess it is okay. Uh, it, to me, it seems to be a little bit um, facile, but, and here as well, you know. But even uh, Frank Lloyd Wright uses sometimes uh, wood in, uh, you know, in a decorative way, trims, trims of wood. But this is not social housing. Let us not have illusions. So <clears throat> these are in Milan, and uh, I look, look, look at the look at the plan. You know, it's just one apartment. You know, or two. Uh, I think it's it's one apartment on the floor. Wow. Look at the kitchen. It's immense. So clearly these apartments are not for uh, any, to use the name of a newspaper that Peter Eisenman published, but he meant architecture New York. Uh, anyway. Roca London Gallery. Uh, <laughs> these were also designed by her, I think, if not by Lady Gaga. Here she is. Um, what can we say, you know, a great architect, a great designer, a great dreamer. But uh, in my opinion, uh, she, 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 she was alone. And she doesn't look too happy here, does she? Here she does, maybe in a crazy way, kind of crazy way. Uh, anyway, she did it. She did it in a big way. Let's 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 uh, let's acknowledge it. Let's 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 uh, uh, let's confess. She truly did it in a big way. 
the bigger, I mean, it cannot be possible bigger than, than, than what she, she, she did. I still don't understand why she chose to share the Domus Eterna with her father and the other person was uh, banished aside as she was. But he, here she looks like a little girl almost, you know. Um, and you have to be a little girl and you have to be a little boy if you want to be creative. Otherwise, you are, no, you are just a follower. She was a leader, not a follower. She had passion, she had fire. In fact, I saw at the Guggenheim Museum in New York, uh, I had a chance to see a retrospective with her work. And uh, there, there was an interview with her. And what, during the interview, a young man came to her from her office and whispered something in her ear, you know, probably something about a job, about a project. And she told him, I was astonished, right there in front of the camera, you are fired. She fired that person on the spot, you know, while she was filmed. I couldn't believe my eyes. So I imagine, you know, she was not, she was not someone, uh, you know, to, 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 pay, to play games with. Anyway. There are still people who think that women cannot be architects or designers. They are totally wrong. I mean, here we have the example, the living example, because she's still living. She, she lives, she continues to live through her legacy. I, I repeat, an Arab woman in London, I mean, you know, she had to fight off extreme difficulties, prejudice and all kinds, and, and, and she did, she succeeded. I mean, she received the title of a dame from the Queen of England, although she was born in, in, in Iraq. Now, this is not Zaha Hadid, you know who this is is the other developer in Milano. I don't know if he built for himself. This is the man with the uh, cowboy boots uh, made of lizard leather, uh, Daniel Lipskind. Dr. Honoris Causa at U, uh, UAUEM, uh, Yonminku University. I think they are here in me in uh, in Miami, you know, starting the the construction for the 1,000 uh, towers, in Miami. Uh, maybe she is here in the in the Russians' home. Uh, that man who built uh, the immodest house in uh, above the forests of Russia. <laughs> well, with a department who designed and produced uh, your own, uh, you know, gloves and, and bag and so on, <laughs> you can do anything, of course. Anyway, one thing is for sure, this woman who also loved to play, he also worked very seriously, and that's why she was able to arrive at such uh, extravagances, because uh, I understood she even had a plane, her own plane. If I'm not wrong, I think she had a, a black plane around. But I think deep down she was alone, more than maybe other people, maybe. And here he is, <laughs> the younger German who, at first, as I said, uh, he didn't like, she didn't like him, but in the end he became indispensable to her. And now he runs her office. And in my opinion, she did, right to hire him. I think he's a brilliant man and, uh, you know, what can you say? He's as, as, as exceptional as she was. And uh, anyway, here she is younger. Uh, 
you know who he is, the Prime Minister of England. I don't know why I, I incorporated him. I prepared this presentation a while ago. Here she is again. Again. She does look like a little girl, yes. <laughs> I feel like laughing, you know. I need we we need people like her, you know. Who, you can tell that she has a mischievousness, you know, that she's able to do something, uh, you know, a little bit uh, off the grid, so to speak. We need people who love to do things off the grid. We have too many of those who are we inside the grid. We need people outside of the grid, and she is one of them. You can tell. You look at her face, and you can tell. I regret I didn't meet her uh, personally. Uh, I had a friend in the States who was friends with her, Lebia Suds, and uh, <laughs> he told me once that they had a fight, actually not him with her, but her with uh, his wife in the plane. <laughs> anyway, these are facts of life. You know. Here she is with a uh, handsome Rem Kolhas. Um, they look uh, good both. And they were both lucky to be students in an incredible school. Extremely free, extremely free. And it pays because if you look now on Wikipedia at Architectural Association, at the bottom of the, of the article, you'll see the alumni of AA. They still move the, the world of architecture. Maybe 80% of the significant architects of the world went through that school. It is incredible what it means to have a school that understands not to be rigid, not to be strict, but to allow the imagination of the students to flourish. Dame Zaha Hadid, 1950, 2016. I see women the world over as smart, gifted, and strong with a talent and commitment to transform lives. I totally agree. And we expect the change to come from them more than from men these days. Architecture is really about well-being. On the one hand, it's about shelter, but it's also about pleasure. Yes, yes, in a way. But I would, I, I would still include a kitchen in a, in a home, uh, Zaha, if you allow me. I started out trying to create buildings that would spark like isolated jewels. Now I want them to connect, to form a new kind of landscape, to flow together with contemporary cities and the lives of their people. There are 360 degrees, so why stick to one? <laughs> Indeed, why? Throw away the T-square and the rectangle right now. Throw them away, please because they are really handicapping you, you know. A T-square forces you already not only to draw in a rectangular way, but also to see the world in a rectangular mode. And that's the big problem. I know there were good buildings drawn with a T-square. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright used the T-square, and so did Le Corbusier. But we different, live in a different world, plus we have different tools. Why not use them? There are 360 degrees, so why stick to one? Indeed, to the 90 degrees. Here she is with Frank Gehry, the other uh, wild man who also is considered by some as being uh, frivolous and doing so-called uh, duck architecture. Yeah, yeah, of course. Who are, who are we to criticize? Here are two people who made the architecture, you know, uh, uh, intrigue us and stir us up, you know, and, uh, you know, who are those who, who criticize them? You know? What do they do? Let us show, let, let them show us. They have nothing to show. I don't know who these people are. Yes, I do. This is Sir Norman Foster and this is Dame Zaha Hadid and I don't know who these happy people are. I think this is, this is Peter Cook. And uh, they, I know who this gentleman is. This is the Czech uh, architect who died himself in 2012 or so, uh, Jan uh, Klopnik or something. And I think this is Amanda Lever. Lever. Yes, I think so. Anyway, a group of famous people. Um, yeah. 
And I don't know who these are, but we recognize Zaha in the center. And uh, here she is again. Sorry about this. I don't know what, uh, how this showed up here. And uh, hello, Zaha. And this is the exhibition for Malevich uh, that she did. Uh, and uh, obviously, she was paying homage to her beloved uh, Russian constructivist. And here she is smiling in one of her buildings. And now we go to the third presentation. So we have two more. Indeed, this is an homage, or we try to make it an homage to Zaha. So I'll go to architect uh, Zaha Hadid uh, uh, three, yes. I think this is, okay. I'm not sure this is the correct order, but we'll start with this one. So again, born in 1950, died in 2016 on the 31st of March. I like this picture of her. You know, she, she looks like a willful, determined architect. And uh, she was. This is a, you'll see three or four of, of her buildings, which I like the most. This is one of them from 2005 in Germany. And I really like this building. Uh, it's, uh, it is a little bit brutalist, but it is unexpected in its uh, formulation and it truly has power. Uh, it's, uh, it's um, you know, it, it's almost a work of nature, not a work of man. I mean, yes, there is geometry, but it is a geometry that uh, doesn't follow the, the conventional uh, trajectory. I'm not so sure about this big window here, but otherwise, whenever she fragments, I think she does it very convincingly. And uh, even the underbelly of the building is, uh, is, uh, is impressive, you know, kind of a man-made cave. So this is in Wolfsburg in, uh, in Germany. Architecture is supposed to move, to be emotional and uh, uh, to, 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 to stir up your imagination, your heart. And I think some of her best, best buildings do that. I mean, look at, look at the landscape, look at the plan, look at uh, uh, details if you want, you know, this, this window is as it is, but the, the, combined with the lighting coming from above, above, it becomes an event. This is an initial sketch. It would be difficult to recognize the sketch into the final building. I think the final building is even more organic than the sketch. This is a model. But we see here kind of the sketch, no? We see uh, this uh, kind of rectangular prism and then, you know, the fluctuating uh, hills and valleys underneath and well here not so much above but there is a connection between that initial sketch and what we see in the section it's a science center but playfully done and you see the relationship between abstract notations and the reality of the building and they don't contradict each other so if there is a so-called conceptual level is represented graphically in an abstract, playful way. This is also an excellent work. A bridge pavilion is at uh, Spain. Look at this. It is glorious because it is not contrived by reason. It is not. It's really free and yet, uh, it, and yet. Uh, um, not not uh, not dispersing in, in in a freedom that is not sustained. I like this building very much. It's a bridge, but it's also a building. And I like to imagine that the people who use this bridge to to, to cross over the that open space uh, are, if not transformed, but moved 
by 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 using this this space a little bit cave like it's impossible not to vibrate to an architecture which is original which is organic which is moving which is free you do even if you are not an architect or you are not an artist or you are not necessarily uh, you know observing maybe in detail certain things and analyzing but still i i'm sure it has an impact i like the way it looks from above look at this In Spain also, she made a proposal, which I saw in that exhibition at the Guggenheim. It was the project I liked the most. It was not built. It was a center of Islamic culture in Madrid. And I liked it very much because I felt there was something of her own spiritual background and past, because it was about the Muslim culture. And uh, I regret it was not built. But I remember then, and I, I searched for it on the web. I couldn't find it. I would have liked to show it to you. Um, it was a very interesting project uh, that didn't come into being, that was not built. But this one did also in Spain. And look what's going on here, you know, a beautiful ornamentation, which is so free and yet at the same time it is, uh, you know, uh, controlled. I think very nice. But without uh, digital technology, you could not have done this. Uh, no. I'm very surprised, actually, that uh, there are people who think that the digital technologies destroyed architecture. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. Yes, maybe sometimes uh, digital technologies are not used with discrimination or with the questionable uh, results, but uh, all in all, uh, it also contributed to, to the rejuvenation of architecture. And there are people who, 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 who do remarkable things using the, the newest technologies. I, I do not use it myself, but I appreciate it and I appreciate uh, when the results are creative, as they are in this case. Uh, Zaha didn't know how to use um, sophisticated softwares either, nor does uh, Frank Gehry, but they have a, you know, a large laboratory with experts, with people who use them very well and they appreciate them. And so, you know, you don't necessarily have to yourself handle the computer, but if you appreciate this kind of work, you hire the right people and then you can build anything. You saw, she drew manually. And from a manual sketch, such a building came into being. I think this is better than what Caladrava does. Calatrava is a little bit too uh, you know, stuck into his own uh, expressionist technique. Zaha is freer. Now we arrive at another exceptional work in Korea, in Seoul, from 2007 to 2013. I think she did some of her best works kind of between 2000s and 2015, you know, like the last 15 years or so of her, of her life. Uh, this is a powerful work. A large work is, uh, is uh, you know, uh, <laughs> you don't know where is the, where does the building end and where the landscape begins or, or vice versa. They become one. I mean, look at the other buildings around, you know, they are spectators 
of the show, and the show belongs to Zaha Hadid and Patrick Schumacher and their office. They made it possible. Uh, it's amazing the, the fluidity of, 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 the, of, of the whole thing. Uh, look at this. Of course, the, the timid one would say, why aren't these uh, perpendicular on the ground? Why aren't they vertical? Well, the timid one could also ask the trees, why, why are they so often a little bit like this? You know, why not? Just because the timidity uh, uh, has questions, I think this is a, an excellent building. Now you might say, where are the windows? Yes, it's a legitimate question, but maybe for this program, you know, it's a huge mall here. And, you know, uh, for certain programs, it's possible to, to not have, but although I think it is a loss in the end, and it's possible now because of the climate change, then the issues of uh, sustainability, uh, we should reconsider a little bit certain things. Maybe they themselves would have built differently. I don't know. I don't know. But the interior is kind of uh, the trademark uh, Zaha Hadid, uh, very white and very smooth and sleek. And to me, that is, uh, is, is, uh, is really not the best. But what can we do just to build such building one building of this magnitude I and mean, amplitude look at this is huge it is huge and it does have visual surprises everywhere and look at the plan i think it's glorious it's glorious because it's 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 not rationalistic it's uh, organic it's uh, and yet it makes sense. It's not, it's not that it doesn't have order. It does have order, but a different kind of order. What is called now spontaneous order, the, the order of nature. And you saw those underwater animals. You know, there are things in nature that resemble what Zaha Hadid here. This is a building from 2015, uh, built with uh, two skyscrapers and uh, base, if we can call it so. Also, I would say an excellent work. Uh, and uh, with, you know, a lot of variety, you know, look at the towers, they are different from what we see at the bottom. And um, <laughs> again, if an architect built just these two towers and would, would have considered himself or herself accomplished. But this is a small part of her, of her work. And of course, China experiments. China, the China of Mao, you know. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable the level of freedom they arrived at. I mean, just what happens here between these blocks, these, these, uh, these parts of the buildings is, is a symphonic work. Look at these windows here, you know, you don't know what's going on, you know. Are we still in, in, in the field of conventionality with uh, flat floors, horizontal floors? And it's, 
it's freedom, you know, it's, it's, it's changing the perceptions, it's changing everything. Uh, even here, the tower. The Morpheus Hotel, which we saw the drawings of in Macau, uh, which, in my opinion, shows a different phase in, in the work of their office and in her, her own work. Um, that's where I mentioned the Gothic and the Gothic Cathedral a little bit, but there are also other influences. It's uh, the fragmentation, the geometric play becomes more intricate. Uh, there is the embroidering, the embroidery, the architectural embroidery. Uh, it, it, there is a change here occurring. So her office is, 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 is changing itself. It's a, it's a very interesting work. Yes, it's commercial. Yes, it's a hotel. What can we do? But, uh, you know, architecturally speaking, it's engaging, it's uh, complex. And there is a showy side, yes, it is, it, it has. But the hotels in general have this, uh, and, uh, you know, why not uh, offer uh, something like this as opposed to something that is uh, explicitly uh, commercial and pop and banal? And we do see the ornament coming back to architecture, clearly. You know, you see the, the other buildings to the left and to the right, and then we see this. It's not so, it's not so disjuncted from its neighbors, actually. But it has parts that are different, like the big uh, erosion, as I call it, the big opening in the center. Here, here where the structure becomes ornament and the ornament becomes structure. Okay, and now we go to the last presentation um, with the works of uh, the new works of her office after she died. But in my opinion, she didn't die. And, uh, and uh, the works of her office are continuing what she started. Zaka Architects. Uh, that's how it is called now, uh, Zaha Hadid Architects. This is now, this is now the, the man who runs the show, who runs the office, and uh, I like him. He's temperamental, very temperamental. You know, I, I, I saw him in some interviews, in some, uh, some uh, discussions with, like, for example, with Mark Foster Gage, and uh, he's boiling, and he has courage. You know, I saw him at Sci Arc in Los Angeles, uh, confronting the professors, almost cleaning the floor with some of them. He does have courage, but it's also true that he runs a very prestigious office and, uh, you know, she, he has the, the intrinsic uh, force of accomplishment behind him. He's also a philosopher and a theoretician. He even has a PhD in architecture, something that uh, most famous architects don't have, but he does have. Monsieur Patrick Schumacher. Here they are together, the little girl Zaha Hadid and the German master with uh, strange uh, colors uh, to his uh, puffy, uh, puffy coat. I think they got along very well. A, a most unlikely pair, really. Uh, an Iraqi, uh, Baghdad-born uh, woman and a German uh, man, 
probably struggling in his youth because I, in my opinion, he didn't come from a you know, highly privileged family. This is my assumption, struggling. He even went back to work, back to study while after he started to work for her, you know, to earn her his degree and he worked his way. But uh, yes, it's something nice actually about both. And look at them here, you know, they, they truly, I think that in time they developed a, a, a great partnership. And uh, I like, I particularly like this picture with a dreamy Zaha Hadid, look at her, uh, at her eyes and, uh, and look at the German man. He looks like, um, you know, I'm very young here, but uh, with an inner determination and the books behind it, they, they were ready to change the world. And I, I'm curious about their relationship. Some people thought they were lovers, but it seems they were not. So I think they, who knows, maybe she found in him the child she never had. Now the difference in age was not so big between them, but you understand a man maybe is always a child um, in relationship with any woman, even a younger woman than him. Uh, all in all, <laughs> This was a very unique uh, arrangement, so to speak, of fate, because usually, you know, the man was the boss and the man hired the woman, like Alvar Alto hired the younger, uh, I forgot her name, and she became his uh, second wife, uh, Lisa, or uh, something like this. And, uh, but in this case, she was the boss and she hired with, with, uh, with uh, reluctance at first, uh, the young man on the right. Uh, <laughs> and he looks mischievous too. I like I like them both. I really I really do. I wish I knew them. And uh, who knows? Maybe with Patrick, maybe one day we could meet. Maybe here they are. You know, of course they made it to the to the fashion. Uh, but uh, Patrick is kind of relaxed, you know, and uh, as if he's passing by, uh, really uh, towards going towards something else. Uh, in essence, you know, children, you know, children, as the saying goes in, in the United States, I'm too old to grow up. I think in a way they both had that goal. I can tell, I see the little girl in her and I see the little boy in him. Maybe he has a certain level of maturity on his face, but uh, I saw the child as well. Anyway, the Russian mega smart city. So Zaha Hadid architects working in collaboration with Russia based uh, these pride architects had been selected as one of the three consortium to realize this neighborhood in, uh, in Moscow. And uh, I'm not going to read everything, but this is what they proposed. My God, my God, and they are probably going to build it because you saw the Russians are, stoppable, are unstoppable, like that man who built that house above the forest. If they have the money and some do, they can build anything. And uh, I think uh, they, they are going to build this. Um, now, this is in China. Uh, let me see, I have, yeah. I even had a nice, yeah, there is a beautiful, uh, in my opinion, a beautiful uh, YouTube uh, film about this project. You can see it if you, photograph this, uh, if you write down this, uh, you don't necessarily, you just type in uh, Zaha Architects and you are going to arrive at this project. Uh, in a previous presentation, I showed the video too, but I noticed that actually the videos from YouTube are not technically the best of Zoom, maybe because of the, my old uh, laptop. Um, so fluidity is fluidity is and fluidity is again. The more the better, seems to say uh, Zaha Hadid architects. She didn't die. Five Zaha Hadid design projects still to be finished following uh, the architect's death. This one we saw the Morpheus Hotel. I'm not insisting, but uh, you know, you see maybe a few other pictures. The Morpheus Hotel in Macau. And uh, The One Thousand Museum, this is how it is called, but it's actually with condominiums in Miami, uh, is built 
man, she died actually when, when she went to inspect uh, the site. It's built. I like it more during construction actually than the final work, but uh, if, if something saddens me is that, you know, this building was built for the very rich and, uh, you know, their glory, in my opinion, cannot ignore wider realities and shouldn't ignore, I think. The city center in this one we saw, we saw already, I am not insisting. Uh, in, in, uh, in Mexico, now Beijing new international airport, which opened already, and it is, I think, uh, an impressive, an impressive airport to cope with. But yes, the pandemic changed many things. China was building what is built as the world's biggest airport and probably is unofficially called the Beijing International Airport to handle 100 million passengers a year by the year 2040. How come China handled the pandemic? This is a mystery to me. It started there and, you know, Romania, which has a population 100 times smaller than China, has a much larger number of deaths and new cases. And uh, um, even if the reports from China are not totally correct, I still think there is some truth there and uh, it's just Unbelievable, how come China was able to contain, maybe not perfectly, but in good measure, the pandemic and uh, most of the other countries, very developed, some of them couldn't. Designed to look like a phoenix spreading its wings, construction was delayed in December last year when I made this presentation two years ago, when more than 200 tombs from the King King dynasty were unearthed during construction. And here it is in the model. Uh, well, it has something also of those subaquatic uh, creatures that I showed. So the relationship between the buildings by, Z uh, by Zaha and uh, nature is not absent. It's a brilliant building. It's huge and it's, it's, um, it has uh, complexities uh, of structure and even aesthetical complexities, which are uh, remarkable. Maybe Dostoevsky was right. Beauty will save the world. And if he was right, then it is worthy of building beautiful buildings. to coordinate, I mean, look at the structure, look at the, I mean, to coordinate such a work, you, you need a, a very sophisticated, uh, you know, atelier and uh, what can I say? You know, it's, it, it requires excellence at all levels. Look at the ceiling. Please be kind and turn off the microphone. Thank you. Please be kind and turn off the microphone. Oh. Sorry. Now, uh, this metro station in uh, Saudi Arabia and Riyadh uh, was supposed to open in 2019. This beautifully designed project has all the distinctive trademark curves of a Hadid structure, a key part of the city's transport network. The station is on the edge of the financial district and will function as a major 
interchange between three of the city's six new metro lines. Now, I don't know about this. It seems to be a little bit uh, over the board, a little bit. <laughs> Uh, for my taste, uh, almost predictably, there is a system and it's, it's, yes, there are waves, but I don't know. Anyway. It's built. It is built. Uh, this is the project, but it is built. I don't know if it's finalized, but it is built. One North Master Plan in Singapore opens in 2021. This plan for a large neighborhood in the city state capable of serving a population of 138,000. Understood that Singapore is considered the, the Switzerland of Southeast Asia. The sound wave concert called by Zaha Hadid Architects in, uh, in, uh, in St. Petersburg, I think. Uh, it's, it is in Russia. And it was done after her death. The, I, if she had nothing to do with this project per se. The design of the sound wave concert hall is based on the properties of musical sound resonance, creating wave vibrations in a continuous smooth surface. Uh, anyway, um, they are probably building it. They win competitions all the time. Now, I'm not going to read all this, uh, all this uh, text now at the end of the presentation. Uh, you are probably tired and I am a little bit tired too. But uh, if you are interested, you can find information about it, about this Philharmonic Concert Hall uh, in, uh, in, in Russia. So they have plenty of works, uh, plenty of works. She died, but she didn't die. This is my opinion. She didn't die. This is the power of art or good work in art that it transcends time. Uh, it, it, art has the power to transgress time and uh, is probably the only one which has the power. And I, 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 this power, and I include here also other fields which are, even though not explicitly belonging to art, they are kind of art. Even science at its best, I think, is art. I know it's my sound uh, strangely. Now, the project director of this project said Russia has been a formative influence on Zaha Hadid architects. It's true because of Malevich. From very early in her career, Zaha was attracted to the Russian avant-garde, which who conceived civic spaces as urban condensers that catalyze a public realm of activity to enrich creativity and community, allowing space itself to enhance our understanding and well-being. These principles are embodied within the design of the new Philharmonic Concert Hall. Dimitri Lee's artistic director said, for musicians, this new hall is crucial. It will be a musical instrument that brings the sound to life. And now, uh, we are approaching the, the, the end of the, of the presentation. I, I want to show this uh, list that Patrick Schumacher uh, made with uh, uh, zones or, 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 or uh, steps, or I don't know how to call them, of modernity in architecture, <clears throat> starting with functionalism, going through organicism, rationalism, brutalism, metabolism, high tech. Then at the end of the 20th century, we had <clears throat> postmodernism and deconstructivism. And now, he says, in the 21st century, we have, or we could have, foldism, blobism, swarmism, and tectonism. Now, I'm not so sure about these many isms. I personally wouldn't use words that are uh, formed in this way. But I think there is some truth in what he said. And unfortunately, many of the, the architecture schools in the world and in our country as well are still somewhere here, you know, functionalism. We think that modernism is just about functionalism. Well, it is not. Organicism, rationalism, brutalism, metabolism, high tech, postmodernism, deconstructivism, foldism, blobism, swarmism, tectonism. So there. Since the beginning of the 20th century to the beginning of the 21st century, more than 100 years passed. 
I think we should acknowledge this, that more than 100 years passed and things happened in those 100 years. The world was not static here. So anyway, uh, I, I think his, uh, his uh, besides, I also wouldn't, wouldn't use the word styles, nor these isms, but otherwise I, I feel there is a certain level of correctedness in, in, in what he said. And the tectonism is the last phase of parametricism, which tries to bring back. And in a way, I, I have a feeling that the office itself seems to be questioning the validity of excessive smoothness and whiteness and slickness. And here they are. I mean, this was an image taken from a lecture by Patrick Schumacher, where he is giving examples of, of what he calls tectonism. In other words, bringing tectonics to uh, the fluidities, those white fluidities that Zaha uh, was uh, fond of and, and, and she built many buildings in. Ornament and structure are not separate. Patrick Schumacher said this, Zaha Hadid understood this, and in the present, there are very important architects who are working exactly in this field where structure and ornament collaborate, are not separate. Ornament and structure, structure and ornament, the ornament becomes structure and the structure becomes ornament. So my suggestion to the students is to, 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 to challenge uh, those who, you know, conduct the affairs in the ateliers to reconsider a relationship between the structure and ornament because ornament is not to be forgotten any longer. So um, I will end now the presentation with, uh, I thought I had another page, but is, this is the last one. Ornament and structure are not separate. And I, 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 think, I think if we learn something from, uh, from uh, uh, Zaha Hadid is that, that you cannot have a rigid structure that is self-satisfied and in its predictability, and that you need also the playfulness, even the capriciousness of beauty. And without it, we wouldn't have architecture. That's what I think. And this is what, uh, what um, I feel Zaha Hadid is, um, is telling us. Thank you, and I'm sorry she died, but she didn't die.